This programme features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. This is why the Nkunguma Pride is such a firm favourite. It's Kinky Tail. He just looks ready for a fight. This is still her territory. Ooh. The Evoca boys are here to stay. Ooh. How insane was that? Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Safari Live episode 45. My name is Cody, and joining us behind the camera is Jandre. So we are coming to you from the west flanks of the Kruger National Park site stands here in South Africa. So I'm in a tent and it's a Monday. Not just a Monday, it's the Monday. And Earth Day. That simply means I will be hunting for Easter eggs. We'll be eating chocolate this afternoon. So we need to know about the, the Earth, how to take care of our mother Earth and the destruction of it. We have to be all knowledgeable about that. So, So sorry guys, it seems the gremlins have gotten a hold of Koli in the tent. Well, I'm glad to have them off my back to be very honest. So I am Trishala and I have Seb on camera with me this afternoon. And I'm so glad to be here with you on this, the 45th episode of Safari Lives. Haven't we come a long way? So today I'm going to be looking for Tandi and Tlalamba as well as going to visit the Juma clan den. Hopefully Tsaka will be around. And then of course, Scuba Steve and Snorkel Sarah. Where would we be if we didn't go visit them and see how they are going along, especially now that the dam is slightly low on water. So exciting things happening. So I'm sure that we'll be able to find something or the other. Now Tandi had a kill not too far away from where I am right now. So we're going to go over there and hopefully she will be around. Problem was the kill was there this morning, but she was not. But I have faith that she will be there now. Ben told me I must tell her that he'll be very upset if she's here because he didn't manage to see her. <laughs> of course, a happy Easter and a happy Earth Day to everybody. Koli will definitely be talking a bit more about that as well. But Sydney is also out and Sydney is going to be looking for a host of characters too. So let's go to him so he can say hello. Good afternoon and most of all, welcome to the beginning of the afternoon safari. This is Safari Lives. And I'm coming to you live from the Masai, from the, <laughs> I just made a mistake, apologies. I'm coming to you live from the western side of the Greater Kruger National Park here in South Africa. And for in case if you need my attention, you can follow us on Twitter, hashtag Safari Lives. My plan for this afternoon is looking for the cats. I'll be looking for the lions. I heard the lions has been spotted this morning feeding on a water bark. My way is going there. So now let's cross over to the Masai Mara where David is also looking for the lions. Hello, hello, and 
Jumbo, Jumbo, everyone, and welcome to this other side of Kenya. We are in the Mara Triangle, and you can see what Bunge is trying to show you there is the kind of weather we have been having for the last three, four days. And my name is David, and on camera with me today is Bunge. Bunge, good afternoon. So, Bunge, what do you think we're going to see today? Well, like Sydney, I'm not looking for lions today. I want to go back to the tent where Oli is because he's doing a very special topic today. He won't talk about birds. And I also want to help him to get any bird that I think is either endangered or vulnerable uh, in this part of Kenya. In my mind, I have only one species I'm thinking of, and I am talking of the southern ground hornbill. The southern ground hornbills have uh, been restricted by IUCN as vulnerable at the moment. So just to have a good theme uh, with my friend Oli in the tent, I'll be looking uh, for that particular bird. But of course, all any other birds you're going to see out here, and as Oli must have told you and Sydney, please keep talking to us, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, comments and questions, because today we have a lovely afternoon. The last uh, two, three days have been tough we have been drenched in the storm, we have been beaten, and there's one particular day we were beaten, me and Manu, and we had to go back to camp to warm ourselves up. And saying it's a lovely afternoon is because it is 76 degrees Fahrenheit and 24 degrees Celsius. So, from a distance, I have seen some giraffes, hope they'll be catching up with them, and then I'm gonna take a look where I would say every Three times out of ten times I've taken that path, I have seen uh, ground hornbills, the southern ground hornbills. Not sure uh, the southern ground hornbills are territorial, but either there's something they like eating there, of course, they'll be eating a lot of uh, tortoises, a lot of snails, they get lots of beetles. But it's one area, if someone would get me out of the camp now and tell me, come on, David, go get me some uh, southern ground hornbill. That's the area I will keep going, going. And hopefully I uh, will be able to catch some or see some today. Smells so fresh, so good. At the moment, just enjoying the breeze and seeing the red oat grass just growing. Very, very good. Hopefully I'm going to see my uh, giraffes pretty soon, but as I try to get close to them, why don't we go to Juma to Trish? I really hope that David does find a ground hornbill. That would just tie everything in so nicely, especially since Goli will be speaking about it too. Now I am carefully looking for Tandy because she was in, or rather her kill was in this area. So I'm keeping a keen eye out looking for this kill of hers in the trees. So, haven't found it yet, but I definitely will. We know it's there. Oh, there's a nice two track. Let's take that. Let's take it. I think he said right, eh? Now, while we make our way to where we think Tandy's kill is, maybe we can chat a little bit about Earth Day. Now, I quite like Earth Day because it's sort of a day to appreciate Earth. It's not just about complaining about everything and how horrible we are and destructive we are, but also about appreciation for how wonderful the earth and nature is and the fact that we all get to live in this spectacular place. Which I, I like to appreciate that about Earth Day. Now, I'm looking, oh, there's the drainage on that side. I said something about the drainage as well. But it's always good to just have a good look around anyway, because the thing is, it could have moved. She might have moved it. But we will definitely be able to find it. Now, Earth Day is also the day. It's also a special day for climate change, and we'll talk about that a little bit as we go through 
this episode of Safari Lives. But while I look for Tandi, let us actually go back to last week and see exactly what she's been up to along with Lalamba. Much like a gaggle of aunties at a family lunch, we all couldn't help but gush over what a capable young leopardess Tlalamba has become. On the verge of independence, Tlalamba is already ahead of the game. With an adult male impala kill under her belt, the princess was sitting pretty, though exhausted and impressed by her afternoon's achievements. Her growing experience, stealth and patience no doubt offered her this Impala prize. But as the sun slipped away, with it went the serenity of the scene as Mum Tandi made an unexpected visit looking for a freebie. With so much to go around, some of the resident hyenas made an appearance. But the uninvited guests had no manners when it came to tucking in chasing off Tandi in almost the same way she had chased off her daughter, Tlalamba. The arrival of the hyenas meant the past the Impala kill party game had come to a close, as few leopards are willing to risk taking on one, let alone a pair, of the spotted scavengers. Well, you can see that hyenas can be very badly behaved, but I was very impressed with little Tlalamba that day. She really, that really was a prize. It sort of was, it was almost momentous. It was like a signal to say, I am, I am here and I am going to be a great leopardess. Of course, I believe that her mother will continue to steal kills for her, from her, because that's just, that's just how it seems to be done in the, the Juma family of leopards. Now, I am looking for a big tam boer tea. There seems to be one on the other side. Oh, you all are so proud of Tlalamba. I'm so proud of Tlalamba too. I think oh, it's just, it almost makes you feel like you've seen your kids do something really, really cool. Sorry guys, just looking. Taffa, you say Tlalamba kills her own food now? Yes, she does. And she does it with style. And she is just becoming a really, really good hunter. I mean, I remember the days when she used to still hunt little, um, or oh, I say hunt, but she playfully would, would go after little squirrels and mongoose and fail. <laughs> but it was the most, adorable thing to watch. So she's definitely growing up strong and healthy and definitely with the help of her mother, she's picked up a lot of those, a lot of those qualities of what a good hunting leopard should be like. Hmm, I feel like she is behind me, so I am going to turn around. And while I do that, we will send you to Koli in the tent now that the gremlins have stopped bothering him. So let's go to him. Sorry about the gremlins, but we are still here in a tent. As I've said, today it's Easter Monday, so it simply means we'll, uh, we'll be searching for uh, chocolates that were hidden by an Easter bunny by the name of Lou Louise, who's a director. So she's around the tent and she'll be giving me the clues that she written down. Uh, the small papers, so we'll be looking. So if you see any, any eggs, then you must please tell me. This is an ostrich egg. It's, it's old. As you can see, there's a hole here for people who who love uh, collecting eggs they do this thing because they can last for a lifetime so what I'll be discussing about today is not about eggs it's uh, about endangered uh, species but of birds 
So we have the southern crown hornbill, we have the vultures, we have the grey crown cranes, and an ostrich. Why I've included an ostrich is because uh, it's rare to find them here, to see them here in Juma than in the Mara. So I'll be discussing that again. And then I'll be discussing about the, the reasons why these uh, birds are endangered. Uh, yeah, I'll take you to there. So eggs, I'll be discussing about the color, the formation of the egg, the eggshell, and uh, as you can see, so as you can see this egg, it's just by itself. So it needs to, to produce a live chick. So without a mother. So what I'm going to do now, I'll be playing a clip of ostriches and see what happens with the ostriches. We have the ostrich chicks over there and the parent. This simply means you can see how big those chicks are. They are born precocial. That simply means they are born advanced, more advanced than other birds, altricial birds. They, they, they can walk in a few minutes after hatching and they have feathers. What they do is they they Gizmo is saying uh, ostriches are need to be honored. Yes, they have to. So what 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 why I'm having this egg is this that I'll be talking about shapes and sizes and colors as I've said. This egg, you can see, it's white, and uh, ostriches they uh, they lay eggs on the ground. They just dig a little bit or make some scrape on the surface, and then they lay their eggs there. And as you can see, they are white. They they don't camouflage around their surrounding. But how do they survive? It's easy. You know, an ostrich is a big bird that can weigh up to 80 kilograms, and then it simply means ostriches can be able to chase off the predators from the nest. And then, because this egg is to be big, it will give birth to, to big hatchlings. And the shapes of the, of the eggs, we have five shapes of, of eggs. And it, it depends on the species of, of that particular bird. We have an oval shape, which is this one. You can see it's an oval shape. We have a puriform, we have elliptic, then we have spherical, and we have sub-elliptic. I was trying to uh, to put my board on point there, but it's taken down by the wind, so uh, I will use my, my book to write you that, if it will be good for you to see, but I don't think it will be good because I'm using a pencil to write. Mary, uh, how big ostrich chicks can they get? Is that a question? Yes, if that's that's the question, uh, I can say they can weigh up to. I think it's it's less than a kilogram. I'm not sure about that because uh, what I know is that these eggs they can weigh up to 1.7 kilograms, two millimeter thick, and 50 millimeters in length. So the, the, the chicks, I don't know, but I will look that one up. So while I'm talking about birds, I'll be talking about the color when we come back. But for now, let's go and look David with his bird. It's very true. I mean, we are talking of the ground hornbills, and I'm very convinced that at one point I am going to see them because that I'm sure is going to make uh, all this day. And once we get the ground hornbills, it will be very good. Now, two days ago, uh, people were asking what happened uh, with you and Manu when you almost, uh, you know, caught by the rain. I just want to give you an idea of how it was. Bungi, if you want to come to the dashboard here. We had a very interesting uh, episode, me and Manu, when we got caught by the rains. Uh, 
I don't mind playing that again for one more second. Well, that was two days ago and we survived. Now, what I'm trying to say here, the long rains have arrived, but in a different style, because to me, they looked like, uh, I would call them uh, some mini uh, tropical cyclone that we had like in Mozambique uh, the other day. And in that particular day, my destination was going to look for my favorite pair of lions. The the tree, of course, we did not make it. But last week, I had mixed reactions when I saw that pride. Let's have a look. So it was very interesting because what happened is we started on a normal day like this. The temperatures were good, it was sunny, and we went out. And the next thing, wind started building slowly, slowly, and then the rain started falling. And not taking the chances, of course, we had to bring the flaps down on both sides. We left the front part, kept going another three minutes, everything was down just to make sure we don't take any chances but out of the blues the next thing we had was a huge downpour hills and very strong wind and we stayed in that one particular place for about 20 minutes until things got better and we went back to camp all right we're going to turn here to go close to an area i call the marsh area I've decided to take this route. I almost went to the left, then I'm gonna go right because I know where I'll chance to get to the uh, southern ground hornbill. Now, I was saying earlier, last week, I had some mixed reactions when I saw my favorite pride of lions and let's have a look. Faces cleaned, the sausage cups were not without a sandy feast before bedtime as the bellies were full and eyelids heavy. To some of the younger members' dismay, an older cab made sure to have left space for dessert before settling in with the rest of the pride. Although the majority of the lions were unwilling to leave the carcass, it seemed that Kingtail was simply unable to move as she revealed some severe injuries on her lower hip. Much like the frustration of flies fixed on the injury, we were unable to take our eyes off this wound. That could be a concern for this leading lioness in the pride. However, much like the pronounced kink in her tail, her determined nature will see her come through, as many lions do in similar situations. With the other members of the pride looking out for her, there's hope that this hiccup will not hinder kink tail for too long before she's back into business. The uh, village I come from, should you have asked every man at the end of the day what is her biggest joy, she would tell you my biggest joy today was to see my children sleeping full and my children sleeping with their babies full of food. Now, for the sausage tree pride, to see those cubs nursing or suckling and feeding and going to bed happy, that was pretty special. And I was talking of a mixed feeling because you saw kink there, I would guess about eight, nine, ten days ago, must have gone for a hunt of a male buffalo and being the lead female in most of the hunts, in most of the decisions, I think she burnt her fingers fast and very badly because she incurred that very deep wood. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, the good news are uh, the last time I saw her, she was up and about and that wound is healing very well. 
What happens for many cats? I mean, uh, they got their saliva, they got a lot of antibiotic. So if you... And Deborah, good question. And Deborah, you're wondering how King Till is doing. And you got those words out of my mouth, Deborah. She is doing, I would say, perfect. Deborah was saying, in general, most cats, cheetahs, leopards, lions, their saliva is full of antibiotic. And what you'd see them doing if they get hurt is to keep licking, you know, keep, if they can't get to their wound, because King Till, she's you know, longish female, she would turn around and she kept licking her particular wound. And Deborah, the last I saw her a few days ago, she was walking because initially she couldn't even stand. She would start, she would stand and not for more than 10, 15 seconds, she would go down. So good news are, King Tail is up and about. I did not follow my giraffes because the direction the giraffes were, I could see a storm building. You remember I had promised to some giraffes that I had seen from a distance? And I thought, let me not go that direction. I'm not caught by the rain again, once bitten, twice shy. I thought I'd look for something else. But I think Trish could be having a spotted cat in Juma. Success, we have located Tandy's kill, a little baby in Yala that has been hoisted into the tree. You can have a really good look there. <coughs> up into, oh, bless you, Seb. You. Um, up in that rusted bush willow. Now, this is quite odd because we have a bit of a look around and she isn't around, but neither did Tristan have, him, have her this morning. So we were just wondering, is it odd for, the, for her to leave it here for so long unattended? My suspicion would be it'll only be a matter of time until Tingana discovers it or Talamba discovers it. And I've not known a leopard to waste energy and nutrition in this way. So I definitely think she will be back. Unless for Earth Day she's decided to do her part and she said, maybe you're still alive. <laughs> You're all hoping to see Tandy again? I am too. I'm hoping to catch a nice glimpse of her belly. What do you think? I'd like to see it. Last time I saw her was the first time we noticed she had a bit of a bulge. There by... When was it? Cheetah Catline. I was with Seb, actually. And she waltzed into Juma from Torchwood. And that's when she first had a bit of a bulge. So I'm looking forward to seeing what it looks like now. And of course to see if her behavior has changed in any way. I'm constantly looking around, hoping she'll just be walking through casually to approach her kill here. But I'm not hearing anything. There's some adult Nyala nearby. Laura, you'd like to know if I have any idea where Tlalamba is? Well, the last time any of us have seen her, I think, was when I had a sort of in the central area of Juma not too long ago. And she dragged me through quite um, <laughs> quite an absurd little block. I think I haven't gone properly extreme off-roading in a while, but there she took me. And that was the last time we seen her. I think that must have been about a week ago, maybe a little bit more. But I'm sure she is still around and it's only a matter of time till she smells this and realizes she can get a free meal. Can you hear it? It's really silent. I'm almost... I'm almost waiting for something to come sneaking this way, but there's an adult Nyala nearby, so everything seems pretty okay. Anyway, maybe we'll try and get a look at him just now. Oh, maybe a quick look before we go over. But you can just see the horns peek through there. Yes, there we go. So we're going to sit around and wait, see if this guy reacts to anything. In the meantime, let me send you over to Koli in the tent to continue with his discussions. Yes, I'm still here, but I'm outside now. So this 
Easter egg hunt. It's new to me because in my culture we don't do this around uh, this weekend. So what we do is we gather people, we cook traditional meals, we prepare traditional beer, and we celebrate with the family or the community members. So this egg hunt is new. Please be patient with me because I only heard about this hunt some few days ago. So yeah, and Lou will be giving me clues on where to to find these these eggs. And then uh, after that, if I find an egg, then I'll ask you which bird does this egg belong to. At least Lou saved our lives because she prepared this, and you can see there's a bone here, and then here is our chat. So what I was talking about the egg shapes, it's like this. I was talking about this thing, these things, like this, like this, like this, like this, and like that. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. So these things look the same. So these eggs are different in shape and size, and sometimes even colors. And let's say, for instance, this one will be for starlings. It's a starling, this one. This one is for a chakana. I know most of you don't know a chakana. We don't find chakanas here because we, they love being in the water holes. Then this one, uh, it would be, let's say, a night jar. And this one will be a, a round one, will be uh, bee eaters. Yeah, they say bee eaters. Then this one, which is a uh, sub sub uh what's his name I'm looking for this name elliptical yes sub elliptical we have uh, the kingfishers here we have the kingfishers and remember an egg shape does not necessarily always determine by how the egg will roll but it uh it also determines by the shape of that egg Yeah, if I can put it that way. The shape of the egg influences the... How can I put this? Mm, the, egg of the, 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 egg, the shape of the egg, it determines the how, where, how and where will be the formation of the embryo, if I can say that. Yes, English sometimes. Yeah, so... <coughs> why I'm draw, sorry. Why I'm drawing these eggs and in, 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 in shapes is because you, you know the the egg I was I was holding it was an ostrich egg it belongs to this one it's oval right if if my drawing is cool so what ostrich does they do this let's say take for instance this is a substrate then they will they will make a nest on the ground then the eggs will they will be here and then they won't need any any shape or or any uh, sharp shape, if I can say it, for these eggs to to move or roll away from the nest because they there's a steep ground here so that they won't be able to move away from from the nest. And then we have the of the birds that they have a piriform egg at least a piriform egg it simply means it's pointed egg so they will they will lay egg on the substrate substrate they won't even uh, scrape or what just like the three banded plovers what they do is they will lay their two eggs or three eggs and then if this egg rolls it will roll in circles it won't roll further away from the from that spot and then we have the the kingfishers who who lays eggs in a hole you know the river banks you see the lo lot of holes today you will find uh kingfishers laying, laying eggs in here and most uh kingfishers eggs they are white in color because it's dark and black in here so white color is known to be visible in darkness but i haven't seen that before that's what i've read in the book so that's why they lay white eggs because they avoid stepping on top of that those eggs. So, huh, there's a lot about these eggs, shapes and sizes and colors. But 
I'll be talking about them during the course of the show. So, so for now, let's go to David, who has found some bird. Very good, Oli. It's still right there, and I'm sure you're going to do a lot of Easter eggs. And what we have here, you'll always see them, if you're lucky, laying about two or five eggs. They'll always build their nest, you know, in trees. And this is a black-headed heron. You always see where, where you see her, there's a part of water there. It's green if you look carefully, and not as the tall grass we've been seeing earlier of the cement a trend or the red oat grass and you can see the white bird coming up there and those are egrets and the egrets and the herons have one commonality food and you'll get them in the same type of ecosystem or the same type of habitat any place that has water you'll get these two birds here and the difference is their hunting habits so it's an egress there, but apart from egress, why I stopped here is just to tell Oli we are doing a lot to cover his topic today on birds, because from a distance I think we also saw some sacrodibes. Excellent, Bungay. Yes, if you look carefully there, there's uh, another greater, that, the, the egret there is the greater egret, and the two or three smaller birds there that are black and white, those ones are called sacred ibis. All of them, all the three, four different species, uh, have all been brought here by food because they tend to feed on invertebrates. Be it fish, be it frogs, be it worms, anything that doesn't have a backbone is what they'll be feeding on. And this is pretty close to the marsh area, and that is another black-headed heron. Now, one unique thing about the herons, they're always very patient. They're never in a rush. She may be standing there, and you can see the little crest being blown by the wind, like a ponytail, which makes her look so beautiful, and you wonder, what is she doing there? I'll tell you, you'll be surprised just to know she is on a hunt. They take the time, they look very carefully, and then they'll be able to focus or scan or zero in on whatever they'll be looking for. Then what they do, they just spike, and you see they got very long beaks, and they're very sharp beaks, and they use their beaks as spears. So it could be a fish down there, could be some sort of shrimp, or worm, or frog, and then she gonna throw her beak, and of course, that bang itself is enough, is enough to kill the would-be prey, and then just catch it. If it doesn't die, it might hold it with the beak and just swing it around, left, right, until it dies. Apparently, I've also seen them eating snakes. And the last one I saw, did you see her just looking down? The last I saw, she killed a very small snake. I did not know the type of snake, but apparently she swallowed the snake while still alive, which is quite interesting. I think Bunge was with you, isn't it? We were not live, we didn't, you know, uh, show to the viewers, but we had a chance, you know, just me and Bunge to watch uh, the heron uh, hunt. I have seen some, I would guess, from a distance, it could have been a hammer cop. We're going to go close there and find out. Well, herons are going to leave you to keep hunting. Hopefully, you get some food. But I think Tandy already got her meal. I love how Tandy's kill has now become a character referred to as Tandy's kill. Well, unfortunately, we saw such a sad thing. We have two Nyala around here. Now, they've just moved out of our sight at the moment, but they are hanging about you, and it seems to be a pair, a male and a female. And we're actually wondering if this may be their calf. But I think it would be really risky for adults to wait around and sort of mourning of the death of their child, if it is theirs. I just think it would be such a risky strategy. But who knows? Well... I'll monitor them, see if they walk any further off, but they're sort of behind a termite mound at the moment. So with this baby in the tree, and if Tandi doesn't come along, I think I'd expect Tlalamba or Tingana to come along, and also expect the hyenas to come along, definitely. 
In fact, I'm surprised they haven't come along already. But the whole animal seems to be quite intact. And like we were saying, it doesn't, it doesn't actually smell very bad. In fact, it doesn't smell at all at the moment. It smells just like fresh air and green greenery and grass and soil. Maybe a hint of rain. But that's it, it doesn't smell bad at all. So I'm really expecting that some scavengers will come along and maybe Taka will come along. And he has been seen a few times in the last week and once by me even. The Juma clan is often found reaping the benefits of the muddy pools around the reserve. Tsaka, one of the clan males less often seen, appeared to be nursing a new gash on an old wound. The mud soothes and cools the skin, offering some relief to Tsaka. After a good soak, a patch of shade offered him a comfortable spot away from the hustle and bustle of the Juma clan den. Hyenas are some of the most hardy mammals on earth and this wound will most likely be healed in a matter of weeks. He continued dealing with his wound in the natural way, with licking, and much of it. We would only be guessing as to how he got this injury, perhaps from a hunt or a scuffle within the clan. Being an immigrant male, Tsaka occupies a low rank in the Juma clan hierarchy, but he still seems to be a firm favorite along with his friend Comet amongst the clan females. It's actually such a shame sometimes when the male hyenas have to kind of babysit or be around the den and keep company for all the cubs and sometimes you just need a bit of solace. And I think that's what Saka was looking for, especially since he was nursing that wound. Maybe he'll show up and get a well-deserved meal. I say that, but he doesn't actually deserve it. Tandy deserves it. Nancy, you'd like to know if Tandy could have another kill? I suppose it's possible, but like I was explaining to you about the effort put into taking down this kill, it just doesn't seem right that she would take it down, hoist it, and then, and then leave it. There's so much effort and energy that goes into that. Maybe it was a really good opportunity, and this baby just had managed to cross Tandi's path, last thing it ever did. But then hoist it and keep it for later? I know that some leopards will hoist multiple kills up sort of in a pantry. So she could have another one up in a tree somewhere. But I don't think that she will leave this one. I think if she does, if she has hoisted her kills into trees, even if there are numerous kills, she will not waste. I doubt she will at least. To just abandon this effort that's been put in to killing and hoisting this animal. Well, was I have something that definitely doesn't form in a hard-shelled egg, since it is an Easter theme today, but Goli has some eggs and I hope that he'll keep a chocolate one, especially for me. It's hunting time. So Chandra will be giving me a clue. So because Lou left and then he she gave all the clues to, to Chandra. Thank you, Chandra. Let's read this. A very safari live Easter egg hunt. Ground hornbill. Ungududu. That's a Shanga name, Zulu and Debele name. What do you do? The things you do. Okay? Ungududu. Okay. No trees or cliffs to keep till time. So how about a peck them? <laughs> okay. Hmm. Chandri, where is that? Where is that? Where is that? Ah, uh, Donna, this clue is, is... Yeah, do you know the answer? Please help. Ungududu. That's uh, 
an indigenous name of a ground hornbill. What do you do the things you do? No trees or cliffs to keep till tame. So how about a pecky them? Any clue? Chandu, any clue? What's a pecky them? A pecky them, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, oh, pecky them, it's pecky. A pecky them is to do with elephants. <laughs> because the food structure, which is called pecky them. Yes, it's here. Now I have a clue. I think we have something here. Let's lift this up. Yes. Yes. I have two eggs here. I have two eggs. Yes. Yes. Ah, oh, don't. Have you turned this down? Uh, upside down. Yes. <laughs> Look what I have found. Thank you, Skull. These are the ground hornbills eggs. You know why? Because of the color and the size. They are white because a southern ground hornbill is a tree hole nester. Remember that. One, two, one. Yes. I wonder what's in here. I'll eat them after the show. But I will share them with you, okay? So, southern ground hornbills are Critically endangered species, but we normally see them in the Mara, but we hardly see them here. We have a breeding pair not far away from where we are right now in the tent, but we only see those two because they are running out of habitat they, and then they've been poached for food and for traditional beliefs. I've seen that at my place, people are doing that. They're hunting southern ground hornbills because they have to get the brain. You have to get the beak, the legs. It seems as if all the body parts of the southern ground hornbill, it's used. But I don't know which, whether it's working or not. But maybe it's it's working for, for them, it's working. It's not a good idea to do that. So let's go through the southern ground hornbill in the Mara. Not here. I'll play you a clip. Here it goes. You can see the ground hornbills there. You can see this one, it's having a snack. At least it didn't get an egg, but it got a snack. And it, you can see it has a fantastic Easter moment. This clip, it's, it's uh, last year's clip. And southern ground hornbills, they prefer nesting in these big trees so that uh, they can hide away from their predators. What they do is they will pick a tree cavity, right? They'll go for a tree cavity and then they will lay their eggs there. Up there, like four or five meters high, and then they need these huge trees. And where you find huge trees, it's uh, around the river rhines. And if you can check in the river rhines in the Mara, there are a lot of big trees there. That's why there's a lot of southern ground hornbills. So in those, in those areas, those are where the trees are being washed off by storms and floods. And he, here in, in Juma, we don't often see them, as I've said, because of uh, we're, running, we're running out of these big trees. And so uh, from floods and natural causes and sometimes by people who are cutting down these trees. So I found my two eggs of a southern ground hornbill. For now, let's go and see whether David has his eggs or not. Well, I think uh, only you have a wonderful topic today. And it's very interesting when you talk about, you know, the, uh, the nesting, I would say, or talking about the southern uh, uh, hornbills, because southern ground hornbills, because one of the biggest challenges they're facing today is loss of habitat. We have had so many people logging and cutting down the very big trees uh, that they will use for nesting. I'm going down a small little drainage and I hope I'm going to remain uh, in signal area. It will not take me more than 30 seconds 
I'll be up again. Hopefully, I've survived that. So what I'm saying is, the ground, uh, southern ground hornbills have been facing a lot of challenges, and number one or the main one is uh, a loss of habitat. A friend of mine just whispered to me that around this area there was a cheetah that was spotted this morning, and I guess it is Bushara. I do not know, but Bushara have been uh, seen in this particular area for quite some time. But last week I was spoiled having seen, I think, my favorite uh, cheetah in the Mara, Kenya. Like some kind of mirage, Kakenya showed up on a Tamil Mount early one morning. It has been some time not knowing her whereabouts. However, it was not the time for long greetings as she went straight into business. Using a Tamil Mount as both cover and a vantage point, while a herd of topies wandered around nearby. But the Tamil Mount didn't serve its purpose, leaving Kakenya to scan the landscape for a better position from which she could pinpoint her next meal. Height is paramount for good vantage over the long grass. One of the tortured trees was just right and Kakenya quickly investigated her safety before leaping up the tree. High and generally utilized by leopards, the tricky tree posed a tough challenge for the cheetah. Her tail helped her balance before the search for food continued. Some, I would say 10 years ago, I was in a country south of Kenya called Tanzania, and we were doing a drive. We spotted a cat. Initially, it was a cat, and there were two cats on top of a tree, a big one and a small one. But the area was no off-roading area. We could not get very close. So what we could do is just to use our binoculars to see our cats. We saw the cats and we went back to the camp. And I had a group of guests and I told them it was nice to see a cheetah and her cub on top of a tree. And we fought over that for the next three days on safari because my guests kept telling me, no, those were leopards because Cheetahs do not climb trees, and now you just so. If it's about hunting, cheetahs will take any point for them to scan their surrounding. And in general, people have thought climbing on top of rocks or logs or tumid mounds. But cheetahs, as far as I'm concerned, they're not good climbers like leopards, but have known or they have been known to go up to five meters. I mean, that was about two, three meters high, but I've seen a cheetah going five meters on top of a tree just to have a view of what could be happening. Well, that was Kakenya, and we had not seen her for quite some time. It was very nice to see her, and hopefully she is going to remain around. I'm getting very close to the area. I had promised Oli I could be seeing uh, southern ground hornbills. It's always from this particular point moving this way. So I have only to be very patient, look for them in the grass, or at the edge of the forest that is on my right, the direction I am pointing at. And there must be a lot of good things or good food. They'll always speak from this particular area. From a distance, we've got some wonderful wall of rain coming up. Uh, Bunga, I, I like seeing rain. Personally, I love rain. And we're going to show you how it looks in a different direction, I would say, uh, northeast from where we are. And just look at that. But the bottom line is, look at the lash of the green there. If you look carefully, there's an elephant somewhere. See the middle of the screen? And there's the edge of the old little escarpment and a huge wall of rain. I'm not sure you can hear some frogs. Ian, very good question. How far do some cats like cheetahs go to other countries? Well, Ian, you know the Mara Triangle and the Serengeti National Park uh, are, are one in the same ecosystem, and there's no boundary between between us and them. We have always thought when we don't see a Kenya for a long time, she has gone to Tanzania or Serengeti National Park. And Ian, I'm sure you know cheetahs uh, do not have 
what we call or oh, cheetahs are not territorial apart from the males being territorial uh, once in a while because of food but the females do not have territories they've got very huge home ranges uh, Kenya has been seen from where we are another 50 kilometers I would say in Serengeti National Park so they travel a lot and more so females Ian but what would happen Ian once the females uh, get pregnant and they conceive of course they reduce their movement and they tend to remain in a particular area until of course they give birth but the females who are not pregnant they cover so much ground the two particular cheetahs that we call the border boys we call them border boys because they swing between kenya and tanzania or rather the mara triangle and serengeti national park and the times they disappear for months and i've got friends of mine in tanzania if i talk to them and they'll tell them they have seen the border boys very very good now i only have to keep looking very very hard and hopefully i'll see my hornbills in this particular area and as i'm searching for them i believe oli is looking for more eggs good luck davisito with your hunt of a southern crown hornbill this game is getting more interesting because i've been hunting and searching and searching but what i'll do is I'm, 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 I'm still looking for these eggs. I haven't been given a clue yet, but I'm still searching. Let me get a clue from Giandre. <laughs> Giandre. Okay. The whack of others raises my cheeks. My newborns will kick their eggs to bits. But unlucky, parents need not sorrow. I am safe behind you in a wooden hollow. Ah, easy, easy one. You know, we have uh, African migrants, which are cuckoos. And this one is one of the cuckoos. And I think it's a, let's check what it is. Because remember, we have uh, different cuckoos that lays different eggs in, um, in uh, some birds' nests. They don't build their own nests. So that's why they are called uh, parasitic birds. Uh, what do they leave? Cuckoos, cuckoos, cuckoos. Mm. In a wooden hollow. Have wood. Yes. I have to look for a tree. Yes, there is a tree behind the tent. Let's go and search there. Who knows me? Because I can see it. A hole there. <laughs> yeah. You need to have energy to play this game, hey? Mm -hmm. We have one hole over here. And then there. Oh, here. <laughs> yes. How am I going to take this out? Uh, how am I going to take this out? January, I have a, 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 an egg here, but I don't know. How am I going to take this one out? And I don't want to break this tree, but it's dead. But not a good idea. Maybe someone is living here. Who knows, a lizard, a snake. Ah, oh, January, the egg is here. But I can't take it out. So... Yeah, I can't. It's, it's the hole is, it's, it's way smaller than my fingers. So that's a lavalient cuckoo egg. I will show you in my phone because I, I have, I have, I have a phone there. Yeah, we'll see it later. Let me help Jandro here because a lot of cables. Let me help, help him with this. So it's so interesting how lavalient cuckoos and other cuckoos they, uh, they lay their eggs. And the Valence cuckoos are known to, to, to parasitize with uh, bubbles. Aroma, here in, in Juma we find aromatic bubbles. Aromatic bubbles uh, are these birds that live in a flock. And sometimes they, they, will, they will lay a, white eggs, pale and blue eggs. 
So a lavalent cuckoo, it's uh, designed naturally so to to lay those eggs to mimic the eggs. So what they do is sometimes they don't they don't kick off the the host eggs. They keep them there, and then the the young one when it hatches, it will kick those chicks or those eggs off away from the nest so that they that uh, chick will be fed by that particular uh, bubbler and there's this clip uh, James about James I've, 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 I've recorded it <laughs> so <laughs> I'll be playing you a clip but not now uh, Okay, let's go with the clip. Am I saying let's go with the clip? I, 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 I've recorded this clip uh, uh, sometime last week, and it's all about cuckoos. And, uh, James is talking about the cuckoos, and uh, and here's the clip. Let's listen to this. Um, no, Steve, I don't think the chick knows that those aren't its parents. I think it just grows up begging from whatever it meets when it first hatches from the egg, and that's what feeds it. I don't think it has sufficient self-awareness to know that it looks absolutely nothing like its parents. And in fact, the funniest part of watching these birds often is that they get much bigger than their adoptive parents. <laughs> yeah. So what you've heard about uh, what what this uh, cuckoos do and their host do. So I'll be telling you about how they create this exact uh, egg of an uh, of that host but we'll do that on the next segment so now let's go to Trishala with a kill in a tree Yes, we do have the kill in the tree, but we also have the drone up because we want to be able to find Tandi if she is sneakily about somewhere in these bushes. Now you can see there's my vehicle. Hello. I wonder if you can see my hand if I put it up. No, can't really. Oh, you, you kind of, you, there we go, there we go. Now that you're in drone, can you see my hand? Not really? No. <laughs> That's because it is so hot. And that is the problem because Tandi, if she is around here, will also kind of blend in because she's been... Well, she'll regulate her temperature, but all the surroundings have absorbed all that heat and now she'll blend in very easily. But we thought we'd put the drone up, so at least we'll be able to tell if we get a bright white spot walking about. Well, if she's got movement, that'll be quite easy to see. The problem is the time of day at the moment, it's still cooling down and she might actually just be resting. So we'll probably have a better chance while she, when she gets up and starts to move. But from what we've seen searching around this drainage line, we haven't seen that sort of bright spot and that typical leopard stance as she sits down. Well, you guys must be used to the drone now. Dark colors are the cool areas and the bright colors, of course, the heat. You're loving the drone? I quite like the drone too. It's, it's so nifty. And most of all, it's a great help because it means that we can re relocate many animals. Watch Tandi prove me wrong today. Very cool. Well, we're going to search around a little longer with the drone. And then if we come up with nothing, I'll return here and visit Scuba Steve in the meantime. But while I do my planning, let me send you up to Kenya in the, and the Maasai Mara with David and his favorite bird. Well, Trish, good luck. And my apologies because earlier I thought you had Tandy, not knowing that you had Tandy's kill. Well, you're right, uh, I got my favorite bird in the whole world, and I'm sure you know who she is. I do not need to ask you because this is one, one bird you're not going to miss. Identity. Well, the reason I stopped for it is because I have not been able to catch up the southern ground hornbill for Oli, but I thought this is the national bird of Kenya, it's the national bird of Botswana, and it's David's favorite bird, and this is the lilac-breasted roller. Beautiful bird. Time to preen herself, making sure that all the feathers are in good shape. 
And we all know how she got her name. Of course, the lilac, you can see the lilac is quite conspicuous there. And the roller is because when you see these birds mating, which are rather difficult, when you talk of sexual dimorphism in particular bird species like this one, it's always very difficult for us to tell males from females. But because of the mating display, when you see them in air, you'll see how they roll upwards and then they close the wings, falling down like a stone. That's how they ended up getting their name because they tend also, don't they tend, they do meet in the air. That's, you know, and that's how they got their name. Uh, they meet while rolling. And as we call them, the lilac breasted roller. Looking two together, a male and a female, it's very difficult to tell the male from female. But if you're lucky to see both of them, the male is always slightly larger than the female. And after mating, they tend to go to trees and look for some holes where they lay their eggs. And Bungay, if you ignore my head and you swing way to the left, right there. Now, we've got two different species here of animals. And I just want to move forward a little bit and tell you something about that one particular zebra because she got a wound and hopefully you're going to be able to see it on camera because the wound is on the left side. As I try to go around to do that, I hear my friend is back in business in Sydney. Welcome back. I am back again now after experiencing some technical problems with the vehicle. But now my vehicle is sorted and I'm experiencing a little bit of headache as I was working very hard to get this vehicle up and running. And I am still heading to the Unkuhumas. I believe the Unkuhumas are still lying down somewhere having a water bag. I must have to be sniffing at the smoke from the elephant dung just to clear up my headache and it's doing very well as it was very much strong at the beginning but now I'm feeling much better and I want us to look at what the Unkuhumas has been doing during the week. It was fantastic. The Unkuhuma pride took in the sights and sounds of Chitwadem, relaxing after taking down a young giraffe a few days earlier. With the avocas gallivanting beyond Juma, the pride was lethargic and content, taking on some bed watching and meditation. After a day well spent at the waterhole, the pride was back on the move. Some young stragglers were unwilling to leave. It wasn't too long before the leaders of the move were venturing out of sight, leaving the stubborn duo to follow like sulking toddlers. So the Unkuhumas, after having a meal, normally that is what they do. They prefer to go and just rest for some long hours. And let's hope we'll find them resting as they have been having a very nice meat from the water bark. Without any waste of time, I want us to carry on to where they are and see if we can see them feeding. So they are not very far away from here where we are. We're gonna get there very shortly. So these lions are trying to prove us wrong as there is a mythical story that the lions don't eat the water bark. The Unkuhumas, they will always prove us wrong. <laughs> So now let's go to Tori, who is still discussing about some of the interesting birds.
Yes, I've consumed one of these eggs. But uh, yeah, I'm not uh, full yet. So, uh, talking about eggs and shells, and uh, uh, what I found out uh, some few days ago is that eggs, like an eggshell, is made out of uh, calcium carbonate crystals, and then you can see the holes in there. But you have to use a magnifying glass, like. If you can take a thousand of magnifying glasses and, 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 and put an egg underneath, then you, you'll see all those characters and, and, and features in there. And then what they do is they make up an, an eggshell. And then uh, and the colors that we see in, uh, in, the bird's egg, in the bird's eggs, what they, uh, how they, they get to be there is what? A bird, let's say we have a chamber. May I go outside and explain this, Jerry? Yeah, let's go outside and, and and explain this. Let me take my marking pen. Yes, it's it's amazing, hey, how these uh, like uh, they the parasitic birds they they lay nearly exact eggs of their hosts, more especially the cuckoos. Let's say we have a chamber here, January. Let's say it's a chamber where an egg is supposed to to pass, right? And then this is where the egg will, will be deposited outside. Then here in this chamber we have uh, we have glands. We have glands that produces uh, color, right? And when you see this egg, uh, let's say for instance a jacana egg, because it has wavy lines or, or blotches and and, and, and and some streaks, it means when it passed here or passes here. At this point, it turns, and that's why you you will see an, a wavy egg. And then these eggs with spots, and sometimes with uh, one color like white, blue, to name the few. When they reach this this section, this point, they are stationary. That's when you see all the spots, everything. That's why they they come out with one color or just spots. Awesome, hey. <laughs> Channel is laughing at me, dropping. So I'll, 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 be, I'll be playing a clip. Okay. So I'll be playing this clip because I want to see the different types of of nests. I want to show you different types of nests, but this one is for a vulture. Let's pause here. You can see this this is a vulture right two vultures uh, one is a parent and one it's a it's a young one you can see the the feathers on its head they're still distinctive they because once they grow up they they lose those feathers in their head and, and nest uh, and neck so this is a it's a platform nest i thought we call it platform nest most big birds like rap raptors they have to have a uh, a platform nest because they have this huge wing span and then they have to land on top of a tree rather than going into a tree it will make them difficult for them to take off or to to land there and if you can check their eggs they are oval in shape they don't need to be piriformic because they are protected by the nest so that's why these birds they have uh, white uh, eggs because they don't need any camouflage because they are protected there and what happened is, these trees are, we are losing them. That's why they are vulnerable. As you can see, this, if I can continue here, it's, look, we can see this nest is not in, on top of, of a tree, just in, in the middle of a tree canopy. You know why? Because uh, vultures, they normally, they normally nest in trees that have a thorny canopy, like a torch, a torch tree or torchwood tree. That's why that's they nest. But because those trees are, we are losing those trees, and then the vultures don't have any choice but to choose any tree, a big tree to nest on. So here it will be not easy, but they will just fly off. Not easy for them to take off because you can see the branches are all over the place. And then what happens is these young ones, they are born altricial. So it simply means they are born helpless. They have to be fed by both parents for. A particular period that can take up to 
two months. Yeah. Awesome, hey? Birds, birds, birds. Let me finish off this this clip. As you can see, this tree, how big is it? Yes, so I'll be discussing another thing uh, when I come back again with uh, brood parasitism and uh, my culture and their beliefs. So for now, let's go to Trishala, who's at the Bafelsuk Dam. I always like this because it brings awareness and that's the most important thing. Now, I did want to talk to you about climate change and how this day is relevant to climate change. And it is, in fact, the day that the Paris Agreement was signed by over 190 states, if I'm not mistaken, or parties. And that agreement that was created in Paris, hence the name, um, was signed by all these parties in an effort to mitigate climate change and do their bit in terms of adaptation and mitigation and of course finance um, and what their country is going to do about climate change which is an important sort of time for us all to come together because we are all humans and we're all using the world and the earth together so we ought to be taking care of it together as well so that's another point another important important thing that happened on this day and i wonder if it was actually chosen because of earth day i don't actually know or if earth day was chosen because of the paris agreement or paris agreement chosen because of earth day to do on this day not sure but relevant nonetheless anyway i am going to make my way up to Buffelshook dam now because this kill seems to be going nowhere so i'm going to make my way up to go and visit scuba steve and snorkel sarah oh and there's a stump in front of me we just reverse a little bit there we go there we go yes i'm going to negotiate my way around these bushes and while i do that i will send you to learn a little bit more about the celebrity couple here at juba Water levels at Buffelsuk Dam have steadily dropped as our dry winter approaches. Luckily, Scuba Steve and Snorkel Sarah remain steadfast in their relationship despite the erosion of their home. Being adapted to an amphibious lifestyle, it is only a matter of time until this pair will have to search for a new love nest. As ripples in a dam, so too are the days of these animals' lives. Ah, it's just a soap opera with those two, isn't it? So much going on, all the action that we could possibly ask for here at Juma. <laughs> Our two hippos. Well, I'm going to go out to visit them now. I mean, the kill's not going anywhere and the Tandy is likely to show up if she does at all. Probably a little bit later. So why not go up and visit the celebrity couple? Yay! Sydney has found the lions! How exciting! So let's go over to him. What a beautiful sighting. You can see that I've got uh, some of these lions here and uh, two of them has just stood up now. I can see one is just defecating somewhere behind me, which is usually not a behavior as the lions normally, they prefer to defecate just before the sunset or after the sunset when they start to wake up. So it is uh, unlikely to see these lions today then defecating during the daytime. So I can see all these two lions, which are very close to me here at the moment. They've got very big bellies. I can see that they have been eating for quite a long time here. Unfortunately, the other one has just moved to the bushes. Maybe uh, she's going to come back this side so that I can show you which lion I am referring to. So the Unkuhumas, um, the females, couple of them must be expecting their babies soon as they have been engaged a lot with the avoca males when it comes to their mating activities. By looking at the size of the stomach, I can tell 
<laughs> David, they look very full indeed. And by the look, I can promise you these lions cannot be able to run a long distance. Look at that. That was a beautiful yarn. So when the lions are yawning like this, it can be contagious as yawning is contagious and it does help the lions with the mental efficiency. So it helps them with the mental efficiency as well as the group alert. Look at that belly. You can see that the belly is full. I still want to see the water bark these lions are feeding on, but I can't see where they're hiding it. I can see one of them is somewhere behind the bushes. We're gonna visit him and see what he's doing. Maybe it's the one who is having the carcass. So this is the only species amongst the cat family which has got the tassel by the tip of the tail. So you can see this one is also going to defecate that side as I indicated that one female did the same. So the droppings for the lions, they don't smell nice. And sometimes when the hyenas are around, they do come and eat their droppings when they are still very fresh. So now let's quickly go back to Tolly by the tent. Good luck, Sydney, Fumulani Mikosi. So I've mentioned uh, brute parasitism. You now these birds who, like the, the cuckoos, for example, they, they rely on other species of birds to, to raise their, their chicks. So it simply means the host species population is being po compromised and the, and the parasitic species, it means the population will go up slightly. And I was, uh, I was talking to John Ray when we are off air about the, the eggs. If you can check the eggs, they produce a live chick, right? But how do they do that? Because that thing, it's been deposited there, then it's been left there, and then it's going to incubate, and then after some few weeks, you'll see a chick, a living chick there. But how did they get that oxygen? Because everything that's in there needs oxygen. Because as we know, as humans, a fetus, uh, gets oxygen from the mother's umbilical cord, right? So it works like this. Before I explain further, it's egg hunt. Jandre, crown crane. They have made me a king and a queen of crowns. Yet my nest is humble, safe and sound. Find me to the south of the tent. I am around. All you need is to search the ground. That's west, that's east, and then that's south, then that's north. South of the tent, I'm on the ground. Ho oh ho! I'm still searching, I'm still searching. It doesn't have to be well camouflaged because last time I checked uh, crown cranes, their eggs was, was sort of whitish to dull. And then there are these books showing that uh, they are blue eggs, but I've never seen them. Oh, John Ray, south of the tent. May you please help me? Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or YouTube chat stream, please. Or maybe I need some goggles. Ah. It's supposed to be there. Is it, is it, is it this one? Ah, it's not. <laughs> I thought this was an egg, but you can see this is a, a ball made by a dung beetle. Chandra, do, do you spot something here, Chandra? Chandra can see this thing, but I can't, really can't. Chandra, would you please zoom that so that the viewers will, will see that so that they will, they will tell me where to go. 
<sighs> if it was a snake. Oh! <laughs> I told you. You can see, look at the ants. Simply means they've started eating my lunch. Yes, thank you, the view, all the viewers are saying well done. You can see it's blue. It's a gray crown crane. And you know what's so interesting about these birds? They are ground nesters. And then that simply means they have to have camouflaged eggs, but they don't have camouflaged eggs because they are like ostriches. They they can chase off the predator again. And then what they do is they collect a uh, vegetation uh, of the aquatic plants and then they, they make a mound and they put these eggs on top there. Then they, they incubate, then boom. So I was talking about oxygen, but before I tell you about that again, let's play it, a clip of a gray crown crane. Let's see. Yes. There you can see how beautiful and colorful this bird is. You can see there's there's some movement on the ground there. Yes, it's a chick. It's one chick and they can lay eggs, th uh, three up to four eggs. But one survives in most cases because I will pause a little bit here. One, survi one egg survives because they what they do is they lay these three or four eggs because they know the predators will be there while they are away from the eggs and maybe one or two will survive then when they hatch and if this one is born before that one is born then it will feed much before that one is born because there's no eggs they don't hatch at the same time sometimes they uh, they take up to two days before they hatch between Oh, let's continue genre and play the clip and see what happens after that. Maybe the second chick will appear there, but I doubt. Look how beautiful is that. And this shows that this bird is a ground nesting bird and it's a ground dwelling bird. It means its chick is born precocial. That's after hatching and it will spend a few minutes and then it will be able to, to walk and run and forage and look around and if you can check the vegetation there in the habitat it's more open plains because that's where these birds they prefer to nest and they prefer these open places so that they can spot a predator from far and i've seen them in the in the in the show i was uh, in my room watching there from my computer they chased off this uh, jackal next to their their nest interesting hey yes so, John Ray have an egg, yeah. This is a live egg, a chicken. Yes. And, it, yes. If you can, if you can check here, because uh, my microscope is not working properly, I wanted to, to, to take this under a, a microscope. If you can check here, we can see that there's some scratches here. And this is what I was talking about, the calcium carbonate crystals. They are they are here and then you have you can see the pores here but I can't see them with my naked eye so what happens is these pores oxygen penetrates in there and then they go through inside that egg and then they go to the blood vessels what they do is when the egg gets in the egg then at the same time the carbon dioxide is evaporating yeah, I will tell you much about the oxygen in an egg, but for now, let's go to Trishala. She has some beautiful things around here. Surprise! Look, she's finally appeared. Now, I know that I was making my way up to Buffelzook to say hello to our hippo couple, but then I got the call that she had returned. The sound of my vehicle seemed to, or the sound of the vehicle leaving seemed to attract her. And there she is, on her kill. So she's put to, to rest all our concerns about whether she will eat it, whether she's wasted, whether something else will come along. And she has decided, this is hers. She's making her mark. 
Now, if you look carefully, we can't really see, but you'll see little bits of fur on here just sort of fall to the ground because she's busy cleaning up the areas that she wants to bite through. And before... could almost hear the crushing of the bones just faintly. Absolutely stunning. I'm glad that she's got herself a meal and that she's actually decided to eat it. But like we were asked earlier about other kills, she may have another one in somewhere but this is definitely a good snack for her. Oh, let's just listen again. She's cracking some big bones. Oh. She almost looked like she was going to move the carcass there. can see that her tail is sort of draped over that that piece of wood there, that branch. Sort of offering her a bit more stability. Now she's actually got the sure the bones of a baby Nyala must break quite easily in the jaws of a leopard. Oh no, we've lost the sound to the wind. Oh well, I will tell you that it's, it is quite a, quite a noise and you'd be surprised that a little thing like that is creating, or the little bones and that are being crushed are creating that noise, but they certainly are up against the jaws of a leopard. They really don't stand a chance. Now she's perched herself really well because these branches seem to be just thin enough to not support the weight of others, but big enough to support her own weight. So she's got this kill perfectly perched and she too is perfectly perched. Well, let me send you over to Sydney with his lions and see if they are as active as my big cat is. It is a dinner time here where I am. I am still having the Unkuhumas who are now busy uh, feeding on a water bark. At least now from where I am, we can be able to see the carcass as now they are busy feeding. But it's only one of them who's feeding at the moment. The uh, other ones are tired already and there's still quite a very big piece of meat available there. We are not too sure if maybe the hyenas are going to come later on and try to get something from them. But while I'm watching these beautiful Unkuhumas, I hear that Tandi is also having something to eat. And I would like us to see what the Queen's daughter has been doing last week. With little in the way of camouflage and hunger in his eyes, Tingana made his way towards an oblivious head of wildebeest. As he became one with the road, perhaps he nodded off before being woken by the snort of his lunch disappearing. Ashamed, the aging duke groomed, but was further frustrated by a vicious inch. With nothing going his way, he tried one last thing. A mantra show to remind all that he remains top cat. To boost his ego, the Duke engaged in a steer off with some mangoes.
dry-eyed and reassured, Tingana took his place as king of the Temite Mound. You can see that last week it was packed with quite a lot of actions and some of these clips are confusing us and I would like to apologize on behalf of the team for giving you the clip for Tingana instead of Kuchawa, the queen's daughter. Instead, we saw the queen's ex-boyfriend. Is he the ex-boyfriend? I think he's still the boyfriend because when the time is right, he's still the one who is going and do what he knows best, which is mating with Tandy and the other females in this area. So you can see the leopards, they prefer to enjoy their sunset and they like to sow a lot and the sow from Tingana is always amazing. And I'm sure that is what is fascinating all these females around here. He has been introducing a lot of different uh, unknown girlfriends in this territory. <laughs> So don't get surprised, uh, you might hear some of the engines and the camera clicking, some other vehicles are also enjoying this beautiful sighting. And Nariko, indeed, uh, Tingana is uh, like a king in this area as he has been introducing us to quite a lot of uh, females. But something you must know about the predators and the territorial animals, in fact, the territorial animals, is that uh, holding the territory permanently is always not guaranteed because the fresher and the youngsters can come and take over so but when they've got an opportunity they've got to use it because it's always not guaranteed that tomorrow they will still be in charge So now let's uh, cross over to the Masai Mara where David is having a live antelope. I'm having a dead water bug. Well, well done, uh, Sydney with the Nuku Humas. Now, we got a very special antelope here, and I'm saying it's special because you do not see it in Juma, and you only see it in East Africa, and this one is a Thompson gazelle. That's just a game ranger who have been patrolling. And you see the comfortability of that particular gazelle there with the vehicle passing very close to it and it was not moved. This is the joy we shall get when you see animals trusting vehicles or trusting us. Now, cheetahs in general hunt any type of antelope that is small, not anything bigger than them, smaller than them. And 50% of what they hunt are the Thompson gazelles. You remember earlier I was talking of my friend, Kenya, the cheetah, and she is known to be a very good hunter because I would say every 10 times, eight or so times, when she goes out for a hunt, she'll always catch herself some food. And last week, she did not disappoint me. Let's see. Prepped, Kenya was in her usual top form when she shows signs of hunger. With the landscape being equally dotted with bushes and gazelles, she had her work cut out. Being such an experienced cheetah, she waited, taking her time and possibly confusing the baby antelope with her meerkat-like pose. However, there was no mistaking her. Once the young Thompson gazelle ventured into the open, building up speed and watching for any risky and even surfaces, Kakenya launched for the gazelle, keeping her balance with a swish of her heavy tail. With a successful hunt, Kakenya quickly moved to escape the heat of the day and the tensions of vultures. And I think all of us can say very well done to Kakenya because uh, she did not, you know, she got herself some food. But 
What I found out with most cats, and especially, you know, lions, cheetahs, and leopards, they'll always choose the easiest route to do whatever they want to do, be it moving, drinking, or feeding. Now, Kakenya at that point, she had a choice of a male, she had a choice of a female, and she had a choice of a baby. And apparently, it was a lot easier for her to get the baby and not the mother. Wow. Sorry for the mother and sorry for the baby, but uh, Kakenya had to leave and she got a meal for herself. When they don't go for babies, I have found out them going for females because sometimes the horns will always be a challenge to them. And as I said earlier, you know, most cats will always go for either baby antelopes, be it baby elans, baby nyalas, baby Thompson gazelle, because even Tandy is having a baby nyala. She certainly has. Ooh. Oh, she keeps making me think that she's going to move it, but she isn't. Now she's drawn a lot of attention, Tandy has. There are so many vehicles that want to come in to see her, so you will have to leave soon. But that's okay, because now we know that she's around, she's eating, and she's happy and healthy. And we will be following her around quite a bit. Now, if you look at her belly, it does look pretty round. She's not given us a great view yet. Oh, there you can kind of see her eating this thing. There we go. Now, for those of you who don't know Tandy, Tandy is our female leopard here at Juma. She was born in 2006, so she's quite an old gal. 3-3 three, three female, and she is the mother of the lovely Tlalamba. Oh, you can see little bits of fur falling to the ground. Stunning, absolutely stunning. Every single time you see a leopard and a leopard's coat, it just does not get old because it is the most beautiful thing. Oh, I love the tail. Ravinda, you'd like to know if we'd ever see Tandi giving birth in a tree. Now, I have not heard of leopards giving birth in a tree, and that's for a couple reasons. Firstly, if that baby falls off the tree, we've got a big problem. It's not going to be hidden. It's not going to be hidden from any predators. It's not in a safe, secure, warm environment. And that's what a den provides. Den provides all that. This correct temperature. All babies need to be kept nice and warm and also to be protected because Tani will leave her babies or even with Lalamba, she would have left her for long hours and periods of the day and then only come back at certain times. Now, if you leave a baby in a tree, you might have an issue. Baby falling off, other things, taking and eating baby. So that is very, very unlikely. Also, I suppose the whole act of giving birth in a tree is going to be particularly awkward. Look, looking like she's going to move it, but she isn't. Well, guys, it is my cue to leave here, unfortunately, because they, she is just attracting so much attention. Everybody wants to have a look at her. So we'll be leaving here, so say bye, Tandy, for now. And in the meantime, I'll send you over to Koli, continuing with his egg hunt. I'm sure, Trish, you're enjoying your, your sighting there. Feeding time. I'm not feeding yet. I'm still drawing some eggs. January, let's say we have an egg here, an egg, it's an egg, and then we have uh, an outer membrane here, an inner membrane there, and then we have an S cell here, yeah, then let's take for, for instance, this is a chick, yeah, this is a chick that's ready to, to hatch, yes, have an eye there, yeah. Say for instance. So what happens here is because we have pores here, right? In the A. And then this okay, this but this this thing is attached to, to blood vessels, right? Yeah, something like an umbilical cord here, but call it uh, blood vessels. The air will penetrate in here, it goes in here, and then it will go through this uh 
vessels and then it will it will feed this chick with oxygen but uh, at this point the lungs are not functioning yet right so what will happen is this chick will start by breaking or piercing this SL before it breaks the the shell why it does that it's because it has to receive the air that is, is stored here the oxygen that is stored here and then it will uh, go through the lungs and start breathing why it does that it's because it enables the the chick to have power and energy to break through the shell that's how the chick is born so interestingly so chicks they have this small and uh, flimsy beak right then they have this tooth here we call it egg tooth something like small here not all of them has that just like ostrich uh, chicks they don't have that egg tooth what they do is to break that shell they use their muscular spasm and then they also kick with their legs they have thick legs hey nice one so I'll be playing a clip about vultures, one of our critically endangered uh, bird species. It's so heartbreaking to see these birds ah, declining. So, John, we are playing this clip and then here. You can see these vultures, they are in a kill. And that scene, it looks like an impala, if I'm not mistaken. Tristan was in at the sighting. You can see these are the the white-backed vultures. And then I will pause here a little bit. You can see how this vulture is flying before it goes into at, at the kill. What it does is vultures. They are so they are so interesting because they don't flap their wings. They avoid that to save energy. What they do is they will patch on a tree on top there and then what they do is they will wait for thermal so thermal is when the sun hits the the ground or the floor and then the hot air rises and then it it tends it tends it tends it tends then that's how they want they fly they will just flap once or twice or, or three times then they will they will glide that's what they do so an interesting thing i want to show you when they land let me continue I want to show you these vultures when they land. They don't land like other small birds or other raptors. You'll see they have to bump once or twice or three times before they land. Get that? Look how big is that. And then this wingspan can be up to 2.1 meters. Look at that. Do you see that? Let's pause here. What they do is the vultures because they are these birds that uh, they are sc like scavengers. What they do is they don't have talons like heavy talons like the raptors that they hunt using their 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 feet. They have these uh, talons that are not curved. Okay, they are curved but not like the raptors. And then they have this flat foot structure because they are ground dwelling birds. In most cases, they spend a lot of time at the kill or bathing the. Then what do they have? They have this flat foot so that they can maneuver easily, not like they have this uh, foot structure like this. And then if they had these sharp, heavy nails, they would, they will be difficult for them to take off because of these uh, sharp talons. So they have, they have flat foot. And look at that. And look at the size. And this is a. I thought it was a cave vulture, but uh I, I was talking to ian and then he said it's a juvenile white back this one that just landed you can see that one the on the on the left far left it said it's a juvenile and remember cape vulture and the white back they are they look more or less the same you have to look at the eyes because the white backs have this black eye and then the cape has a, a yellow eye and look how the they feed in there. Let me pause it again. So if you can, if you can, if you can check all these birds, they they have they lack feathers in their in their in their necks. Oh, hello. Why do they? Why are they getting extinct? It's because of cultural beliefs. 
It's because of uh, loss of habitat and uh, they are being hunted for food. What they do is people at my place, they, they believe that these vultures, if you take a head of a vulture, and then you take it to a sangoma or a traditional healer, then it will, you, you, he or she will mix that uh, with some other medicinal things and stuff, and then you will see all your, all your enemies away, your far, something like that. You know, these, I can say, these crazy myths. But people, they still believe in that, but I don't know if it's working or not. So if you can check their, their faces and head, they, they lack feathers there. You know why? It's because they have to put in the head and neck in inside the carcass. That's what that's, that's how they feed. So that it would be easy for them to 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 wash off that that blood those blood stains to avoid infections and illness. What the the other thing I was I, I was I was studying about this uh, vulture is that you, you see this part. Come here, Jandre. If you can check this vulture here, you can see this part here. You can see the feathers. This is called a ruff, and uh, you can also call it a, a scuff. What they do is, because they can fly so high, and up there it's cold. What they do is, they will squeeze their head inside th those feathers, which is called scuff. And then, uh, when they land, then they will just uh, stretch their their necks, and then they will easily cool down because bare skin means it cools down easily. Interesting, hey? <sighs> Let's continue. I'm sure it will, this clip will end soon. You can see how they uh, invade this carcass on top, on the sides, and everywhere. So, we got all the interesting clips, but Trishal, I think, has this most amazing one, which is the clip of the week. Let's go and find out. I was designated for the weaker. I was, which was a really interesting one because I'm very interested in the rutting season of Impala and the way everything goes down. And we were lucky enough to actually be able to witness, to actually be able to, whoops, the actual kickoff of the rutting season, or rather, it's the first time we could see it. You know, we'd seen the, the territorial males sort of chase others away, but for the first time, we actually saw them fight. So let's have a look. Earlier in the week, we were privy to a dispute of note. Word at the watering hole was that one of the rams had wooed his best friend's ewe, resulting in a battle of snorts and sparring as this year's rutting season kicked off. However, their grunts seemed stronger than their charges as with each clash came the sudden realization that neither particularly wanted their eye poked out. But rams will be rams, and after tiring each other out and calling each other's mothers every antelope under the sun, one of the rams retreated. Wait up! You didn't let me finish that one about how bad you smell. I just love their faces. I think the faces give more insult than the actual actions, and I think I could put <laughs> little little speech bubbles for those faces any day, really. I think they're gorgeous. They're a lovely looking antelope, and they've got an attitude. What's not to like? I think it's quite nice. Well, hopefully it'll kick off in full swing very, very soon, and it'll peak during the dark phase of the moon in May. So next month, Lots and lots to look forward to. We'll be focusing on those impalas. Very cool. Now, I'm hoping I'll be able to drive off. And while I do that, driving into the sunset I am today, <laughs> it's quite nice. Let me send you over to David in the Maasai Mara and see what he's got for you. Very well done, uh, Trish. And hopefully the rutting will continue because this is the right time for the impalas to do lots of rutting. We do not have any rutting with these uh, topis here, which is in the background there. 
uh, Anthrops eucotropis. But now look at the base of your screen. There's some little white thing there. I don't know what that thing is. But to the right, if you look carefully there, there's a lioness hiding there in that what you would call the elephant grass. There's a lioness there. And apparently there are two and it's rather difficult for me to identify which pride is this. It could be either the river pride or the marsh breakaway. But where they are, it's very difficult to know which particular pride this is. Now, if you look at the toppies, they're looking in a different direction because where they're looking, there was another female that was walking in that direction and it also laid down. So what happens, the toppies have to be very alert. They have to remain on the tamarind mound just to keep an eye on that lioness so that she does not sneak behind them. Look at the beauty of the Mara. So the other side of those trees is the Mara River and we have such a great view of the landscape here. I'll bet not having these lions getting up for us to have a look at them. I'm surprised, you know, how days go very quickly that today's a Monday and we're doing episode number 45 of Safari Lives and I'm sure it has been a lot of action and definitely next Monday you'll be with us on another episode number 46. We'll just have to have a quick look uh, and see if that lioness is going to wake up or not. And if she doesn't, we have seen at least the ears or partly the head, which is not bad. To me, they look like two females and one that went to the left, so three. And as I said, in that particular position, it's very difficult to know what pride they are from. As I said, it could be either from the marsh breakaway, this is the territory, or the river pride. River pride is the river is the pride that was fighting the other day with the Ololos. And don't forget, the song is still coming up very well that I dedicated to the Ololos. She, she's up. That's right, David, and look at her, David. Look the way she's looking. Now, why she has picked that attention, I have no idea, because the same direction she is looking at, in the same direction the toppies are looking at, and either the one that moved away has picked something, and we have known lions will have a particular way of communicating that we we may not be able to understand. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, is another wonderful episode number 45. Let's all look forward to episode number six. And on behalf of myself and Bungay from the ever-glorious Masimara, we'll take you back to the tent to Oli to look maybe for his last egg. Nothing. I've been searching and searching for for this last final egg. Nothing. Jandre, please, Ndwana, please, 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 please. Ndwana means my homie, my friend, as Patrick used to call me Ndwana. Ah, please, Ndwana. Vultures. The tops of trees are my usual spot for growing, hatching, and observing the lot. But while I circle way up high, as my spotted scavenger friend, he does not lie. <sighs> spotted scavenger. It's a it's a hyena. Spot it's a hyena, 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 hyena. Ah genre. I have searched and searched for, 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 for... Lynn, yes, it is a hyena, but I uh, don't see any hyena bone here. But there was this bone that was consumed by, partially consumed by a hyena. It was a zebra skull. It was partially... Connie, it's a hyena skull, but... Oh! Connie, it's a hyena skull. Yes. <laughs> yes, Connie, you're the best. You're the best. Ooh, I found it. <laughs> I'll play this game 
each and every year. <laughs> I'll be eating, look at, the, look at the chocolate. I'll be eating chocolate. This is amazing. <sighs> so, let me go outside actually, and, and celebrate properly with my lucky socks. I'm the best Lou. I'll be, I'll be eating supper this uh, evening because I found all the eggs. That was uh, the challenge, so I won. So what happens is we're looking forward for n next Easter because it was my first time doing Easter hunt, Easter egg hunt. So hopefully it's the end of the show and I really wanted to search for more eggs. But thank you for watching most of everything, your time, questions and comments and uh, guides, FC and tech guy. Thank you, thank you. We'll see you tomorrow on a safari morning drive. <laughs>